bojoni kan shabadaske gisko kwe ne dej ne kas baru adami ne gwa me gich wian bamaduin Hello friends, thank you for being here. My name is Robin Kimmerer from the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And as we gather here today, we're grateful for the good life that we share. Thank you, Jack, and thanks also to Noon, to SU, and to ESF for putting together this really remarkable and I think historic lecture series of the, of the whole year. And to you, the public, for the tremendous support shown by your continued participation. I'm very much honored to be a part of it. And as I've listened through the past months of these series, it seems to me that something really important is happening here, a, a real groundswell. And it makes me hopeful that there will be a collective will to be very intentional about shaping our common future in this beautiful watershed. I also want to say that my own people, the citizen Potawatomi, have been removed from their land, not once, but in fact, three times removed from our ancestral homelands in the Great Lakes to end up in the dust bowls of Oklahoma. And they are, they are fighting to revitalize traditional language and culture. And so I'm especially moved by the example of the Onondaga Nation and want to thank them, people who are still continuing to be on their ancestral homelands, never removed, and for their courage and strength in maintaining their culture, their stewardship for the same piece of land over generations, and especially for their current actions to protect the lands and waters of Onondaga. And tonight I was asked by the organizers to share some thoughts about the natural history of the Haudenosaunee homelands. And I'm delighted to do that as a botanist and a plant ecologist by training and as a native person, I really view the plants as our teachers. It's part of our tradition is that the, that the plants are our oldest teachers. And so tonight, much of what we'll be talking about are some of the lessons of this place that are taught us by the plants. I'll share some slides with you all to kind of guide us through this. When the Onondaga, oops, I guess maybe, I, there we go, okay. Um, on the Onondaga land rights action um, asks for healing and restoration of this place we live, of the land and the waters. And it seems to me that if we are to en envision what restoration of this place would be like, it's useful to think about the ecosystem condition before the damage began. So we're going to go back in time, as far back as the land can tell the story. So back, not so that we can return to the past, but to use the past, the insights of the past, to give us some, some vision into the future choices that we make regarding healing this place. And if we look at the changes in the land, I don't need to tell anybody here about the kinds of changes that have occurred in our watershed. And tomorrow evening's program will focus more directly on what has happened there. But some of the things we'll be hearing about and talking about are changes in water quality, air quality, the soils, the species with whom we share this land, the um, management practices, food quality, all of the things that influence our material lives here, but also our human relationship to land. And despite all of these changes that have happened, this is still our home. And as we begin thinking about the choices that lie ahead in healing and restoration, I think it's useful just to reflect for a moment about the word ecology that comes from the Greek word oikos, that means home. So when we talk about ecology, we are literally doing the study of home. And then economics, which is often portrayed as in somehow opposition to ecology, is also about home. It's about the management of home. And I think a synthesis between these two ways of thinking, of course, is long overdue. And that's part of our vision for a common future. When we think about restoration and healing and imagining what our common future in our shared home now in this place might be, I think about abundance and how we might envision abundance in our community and not the kind of material abundance that consumer society would try to sell us, but an abundance of human communities, an abundance of good neighbors, clean air, and pure water, 
and an abundance of species with whom we share the planet. That kind of abundance. How do we get there? Tonight, in, in both in this, I'm going to be talking about the outer circles that you see in this model here. I'm going to be talking from perhaps the, the, the perspective of a scientist about what we call the myth of the pristine, about what scholars know about the pre-settlement condition, the ecosystem conditions in the northeastern forests. And then later, Chief Jake Edwards and Jeannie Shenandoah will bring it much more close to home to talk about the Onondaga territories themselves. It would be presumptuous for me as a, as a scientist to try to talk about someone else's homelands, so I'm delighted that Jake and Jeannie will be here to offer us those insights. Jack was talking about the different motivations that science has, and we know that when we think about ecological restoration, science tends to have a privileged voice tends to work up in this corner of the slide here where we see mind. Scientific knowledge tends to be privileged over other ways of knowing. But an indigenous scholar by the name of Greg Cajete has written wonderfully that in traditional ways of thinking, we would never claim to understand something if we only understood it with our mind. We have to understand it with all elements of, all of the human capacity of mind, body, spirit, and emotion. And I hope as we think about the natural history of our, the homelands here, we'll bear all, bring all of those human capacities to bear. Over the series, we've learned from many of the Onondaga Nation speakers about indigenous Haudenosaunee cosmologies. And what I want to think about now is what are the cosmologies or the creation stories that colonizing societies have. What is the creation story for a nation of immigrants? How do we understand our identity and our relationship to place? And I think you could say, fairly enough, that the creation myth of the American frontier has a number of important parts. First of all, part of that creation story is that the settlers, when they came here, encountered tremendous natural abundance in their mind. It was also unmanaged by indigenous people. It was a real wilderness, open to be transformed by the colonists, by the invaders. And Europeans believed that in the New World, from their own writings, they say, we encountered the virgin land, the forest primeval, a wilderness, untouched by human hands. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Some of the information that I want to share with you tonight comes from a wonderful book that I'd recommend to everyone, Bill Cronin's book called Changes in the Land, which is a cultural and natural history of, of the Northeast. And he has done some wonderful work in collecting um, uh, these, these remembrances from the writings of, of colonists. This diagram gives us a quick look at a model for thinking about the interaction of people and their landscape. And what we see is that we can think about this, some ecological trajectory of the, of the communities. And then when native people came to North America, that ecosystem was altered. It was altered by the presence of indigenous people. And you see the upward line there. And then when Euro-Americans came here, the trajectory of the ecology of our place um, also changed again. And when we think about the impact of both Euro-Americans and Native peoples on the land, it's important to remember that Native people, while we say they lived lightly on the land, were in fact skilled, intentional managers of the environment. And when, you, when the, there's this language of the virgin land, but Francis Jennings has, I think, a really provocative phrase of the land was less virgin than widowed, that when native people began to diminish under the hands of the settlers, the land became widowed because, in fact, the native people had been so integral to the well-being of the ecosystem that without them, without their stewardship and care, the land was less than it had been. And so we're now going to start go to think about what was, the, what was our home place like? What was the state of land at the time of settlement? And restoration ecologists would call this the reference ecosystem. A reference ecosystem is that which we hope to restore 
too. And that clearly informs our, our visioning. Um, okay, there we go. So we'll look at that, what the state, what was the state of the pre-settlement ecosystem, first of all, through indigenous eyes. I think Jake and Jeannie may have more to say about that, as have many of our um, speakers through the series. But it seems to me that the Thanksgiving address is a very succinct way of thinking about what was the state of the ecosystem at the time of pre-settlement, where all of the, of, the, of the beings and the forces in the ecosystem are named, their, their duties and responsibilities acknowledged. We'll focus on it through European eyes as well. So how do we know? When we try to say what was the state of the pre-settlement ecosystem, what was this land like 500 or more years ago? The sources of knowledge that scholars have used to try to answer that question come from traditional ecological knowledge of the indigenous people who lived here, from their oral traditions, and from the material cultures of people who inhabited this place. There's also scientific evidence associated with vegetation, things like pollen profiles, and witness trees. Witness trees are the trees that surveyors used when they were platting out the land. Um, instead of driving iron stakes into the ground, they'd say the corner of this plot is this tree, and they would describe the tree in detail, its species, how big it was, etc. And so therefore, we have some idea of what the, the landscape was like, so, simply from these very early um, uh, survey records. Records of merchants, town, court, legislative records, journals, and letters of settlers all helped to piece together the story of what, did the what was the ecosystem condition. When you look at that scholarly literature, what we see is that Europeans encountered large populations of indigenous people, and they describe them as being so beautiful and exceeding Europeans in, in stature and in, in, in physical beauty, and they were really remarkable in the um, nutritional standards, as the, uh, as the Europeans put it. Um, they also encountered a land with eco high ecosystem integrity and resource abundance far greater than what they knew in, in Europe. And if you just look at some of the um, interesting spellings as well of, of the journals of how people describe the landscape, the abundance of sea fish are almost beyond believing had I not seen it with my own eyes. Our boats are bothered by thick schools of fish. Alewives arrived in such multitudes pressing up such shallow waters as will scarce permit them to swim. The herring are stranded in knee-deep piles. Extraordinary abundance. You see here a list of some of the species that settlers encountered. Atlantic salmon, brook trout, eels, fresh wa freshwater mussels by the basketful. Some of the early settlers also commented on the bird life. Waterfowl can be easily hunted, 100 geese in a week, 50 ducks at one shot. It may be counted impossible, but nothing is more certain. There are flocks of doves, by that they meant passenger pigeons, in the millions, without beginning nor ending, and so thick I could see no sun. One might think it was not true, but tis very true, a land of extraordinary abundance. The ecological food chains were intact. The high-level predators were still here. Wolves, wolverines, cougars, and fishers in central New York. Thriving wildlife populations, not only of familiar animals like the deer and the beaver, but bison, elk, and moose were also part of our landscape right here. They also turned their attention to the nature of the forests and talked a lot about how warm you could be if you lived here. Here is good living for those that love good fires. Though it be somewhat cold here in winter, yet we have plenty of fire to warm us and a great deal cheaper than they sell in London. Nay, all Europe is not able to afford such great fires. Their fire is here instead of our bedclothes. They indeed thought of this as an exceptionally rich place. So how does this inform our thinking about restoration and healing and understanding our place here in relationship to it? It's important to ask why was this land so plentiful? 
And the answer will really come in two areas, the gifts of the land, the physical characteristics of these homelands, as well as the gifts of the people, cultural characteristics that also created abundance. Among the physical sources of abundance, we can name glaciers, soils, and seasonality. And those three factors combine to create this very plentiful landscape that settlers encountered. Just to touch briefly on a couple of these points, the glaciers that living here, we kind of take for granted, glaciers having come and gone some time ago, but they left, of course, um, remarkable diversity in our landscape. There are places where the soil was deposited deeply and gives us these deep fertile valleys. There are the organic soils up near Lake um, Ontario, the old Lake Iroquois. There are places where the glaciers scraped the soil away, leaving thin, dry soils, lakes, rivers. All of these things that we tend to take for granted as part of our landscape are, in fact, unique unique to this area. There are very few places on Earth that have this same combination of ecosystem and landform diversity. Um, mountains, lakes, rivers, and forests all packed together in the same place. The soils that we have here are also of remarkable fer fertility, in large part because of what we're experiencing right now, fall. When the leaves fall to the ground, seasonal litter fall, and the decomposition of those leaves makes for extraordinarily rich soils that you won't find in places with this, without our seasonality. There's lots of other attributes of our soils, but much of this has to do with seasonality and glaciers that make it quite unusual. Seasonality, our very sharp four seasons that we have here, also create abundance. Abundance for people who live here. And some of that comes from migration, these seasonal pulses in availability of, of, of wildfowl, waterfowl, for example. Fish, too, will migrate and spawn, and they, their seasonal patterns will change. And then wildlife species, of course, produce many, many offspring in order to deal with the harshness of winter. And so all of these things are concerned with the harsh seasons that we have here yield abundance. The trees, too, in this part of the world are adapted to seasonality. Things like the beeches, the oaks, the hazelnuts, the hickories, etc., will sometimes produce tremendous quantities of food and sometimes not so much. But they tend to balance one another off. And so this became a land of plenty in terms of tree fruit, tree foods. The wetland